So thank you for coming. Um, we've got the, this closing plenary. We've got some really fantastic speakers uh, and um, some very difficult questions. <clears throat> so I mean, broadly, the panel is about development and development studies in turbulent times. Uh, when we look around the world, we of course see the climate crisis, which is becoming ever more acute, particularly in the global south, uh, and particularly in countries that perhaps don't have the resources for rapid adaptation. When you look ahead, we think of estimates of 3 billion human beings needing to migrate to parts of the world that will be livable in uh, 80 years time, as the estimate has been. 3 billion people moving is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people moving. Um, the parts of the world that will be livable in that time. Of course, we're in the post-pandemic context. Countries have a massive debt overhang. There's a very high probability of a, some kind of debt crisis across the global south over the next few years. Estimates of 60 or 70 developing countries in uh, debt distress. Uh, we also have the, the kind of uh, so some of the more unpredictable aspects uh, of technology to deal with and how that's going to be governed and exactly what kind of change might happen very rapidly with artificial intelligence. Essentially, there's, there's a set of really quite unpredictable uh, um, uh, 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 crises and stressors. I mean, crisis implies a sort of very acute, sudden shock. Actually, many of these are sort of more long-run stressors rather than sort of acute shocks, although some of them may manifest in very acute ways. Um, and I think what they, what they bring together is really what I've, I've referred to before as two crises of development or two crises of development studies. One is the kind of the issue about a crisis in the real world, um, and one is really a, about a crisis in development studies. So I think in the real world, some of the questions we're going to try and address in this panel and get try and get views from around the world. I mean, that's really what we're aiming for here, um, because these things can look very different in different parts of the world, uh, depending on the, the local context and uh, local politics, but also uh, the local economy. So, I mean, there's a set of questions around the real world, if, if that's one way of thinking, the material world. You know, what's the core crisis? Is it one crisis? Is it multiple interlinked crises? leading to underpredictable outcomes. Of course, some of the individual crises themselves, the outcomes are somewhat predictable. So it's the interaction of some of these crises that leads to co-evolution and unpredictable outcomes, feedback loops, and that kind of thing. What's the cause? What's the symptoms? Can it be fixed? Whose crisis is it? Very important question. We tend to think of development having had a recently benign period. Of course, for much of the world's population, it hasn't really been that benign. Um, and what are the what are the kind of what are the causes? What are the solutions? Who should frame those? How do we think about those? Um, and then the rather rather uh, uh, doom laden question at the at the end of that was: Is it are we looking at a kind of collapse, and then the kind of consequence of that collapse, or are we looking at a sort of a long stagnation, or you know some kind of uh, some kind of multilateral uh, responses leading to some kind of solution, if a solution is possible? And then the second set of questions is about really the crisis in development studies in terms of the decolonial critique of um, geopolitics of knowledge, who produces knowledge, how does development studies move towards more equitable relationships, how does it move to more kind of global studies rather than sort of northern studies of the south, um, and uh, you know, how do we understand the crisis and how the crisis is understood in different parts of the world, not just in Anglo. Uh, Anglo-Saxon centric view that may sometimes prevail. Um, should development studies move much more rigorously into cross-disciplinary or even transdisciplinary studies? Uh, and ultimately, what's what's the purpose in development studies in a uh, in a very uh, unstable or uh, volatile uh, period ahead? So we have some absolutely fantastic speakers who I'll just uh, introduce each of them in turn, uh, and then we'll hear. Uh, for each of them for 15 minutes, and then we'll have a chance for Q&A. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce, uh, well, some of you would have met her yesterday at the Members Forum, uh, Karina, Karina Bachani. She's Executive Secretary at CLACSO. That's the Latin American Council on Social Sciences. She's a sociologist. Uh, she's a full professor at the University of the Republic, Uruguay. Uh, 
She's also a board member of the International Science Council and the National Research Systems of Uruguay. Her research is about welfare, gender, unpaid work, care and public policy. I think you'll see across the speakers there's really a uh, quite a strong theme of not just doing research but actually an engagement with public policy as well. Uh, next we have Sibika uh, Plache. He's president of the uh, South African Development Studies Association. He's based at UNISA, which is the University of South Africa in the Department of Development Studies. His research is around the ethics and philosophy of development. Then we have Unmi Kim. She's president of Ewa Uni Women's University uh, in Korea. She's a professor of international studies. Uh, she was a former dean of the graduate school, a former director of the Institute for Development and Human Security. And her research is really around international development cooperation and particularly around development studies. She was also a former president of the Korean Association of International Development and Cooperation. And then finally, we have uh, Arif Anshari Youssef, who is professor of economics at Padjadjaran University, Indonesia. He's also a visiting professor at the Australian National University, King's College in London, and the United Nations University, WIDA. He established the SDG Center at Padjadjaran and was the inaugural director. His research on economic development, poverty, inequality, uh, and the, particularly the relationship between the economy and the environment. He's also president of the Indonesian Regional Science Association. So as you can see, we've got some fantastic speakers. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear their thoughts on how these things look from different parts of the world uh, and also what development studies should do about these things. So I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Karina. Thank you. Hello to everyone, and many thanks for the invitation to be in here. Andrew, Susan, thanks. Uh, I'm really happy to, to be here and share some thoughts uh, with you today. Uh, I will try to address the, the questions or the topic uh, from the perspective uh, of CLACSO, the Latin American Council for Social Science. As I said yesterday, we are uh, a network based in Latin America with members uh, from Latin America and the Caribbean, but also members from, from all around the world. Uh, I will start by saying a few words uh, about the context in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, if I have to, to choose uh, an image to summarize the current moment in Latin America, maybe I will choose the crossroad. A, a, cross, a complex crossroad uh, due to a combination of economic, environmental, political, ideological, cultural, social, and health phenomena that is happening in our region. This complexity goes beyond the serious uh, problem of poverty, lack of employment, or wealth concentrations, and involves also other dimensions such as human rights, racism, inequalities, migrations, corruptions, violence, insecurity, the postponement of indigenous people's rights, the, the absence of state institutions, social mobilization, the quality of democracy, authoritarian drift of some governments in Latin America, lack of opportunities and institutional weakness of the state. Over the past two decades, many transformations have taken place in our region in different and often conflicting dimensions. Alongside anti-elitist programs and inclusive perspectives, for example, the economic dependence on the exploitation of natural resources has also been maintained or even intensified in these past two decades. Likewise, the state has begun to regain institutional substance and regulatory power, but the tax system has almost not been touched or modified. And numerous forms of labor and social precariousness has been sustained. In the current political context, on one hand, we observe the rise and the return of right-wing neoconservative and neoliberal governments with regressive social policies, setbacks in terms of rights 
and decent life conditions, as well as violation of institutionalism and non-respect of political and civil liberties and rights. But on the other hand, we also see a persistent and in some cases a revitalization of progressive or popular governments at the national level, the two last cases, Brazil and Colombia. Furthermore, despite the relative improvement of economic and social indicators in recent decades, inequality persists and worsens, worsens sorry, at an alarming rate in this context. Inequality, as you know, is a historical and structural characteristic of Latin America and the Caribbean society that has persisted and reproduced even during periods of economic growth and prosperity. Its high levels represent a clear obstacle to the exercise of people's rights and the expansion of citizenship and democracy. More than half of the population in Latin America still lives in poverty or extreme poverty. In addition, the middle class, which is at risk of falling into the same situation, and the majority of whom work in informal jobs without social protection, represent 40% of the population in our region. The fight against these and other dimensions of inequality has not been effective. And today, more than ever, it continues to be a central challenge for societies and for development studies. That's why I will try to focus the different panel questions from the perspective of inequality and try to address critical note that we need to understand uh, and develop more in the development studies. Uh, given the diversity and the complexity of factors that uh, constitute the, the crisis in our region, changes are required to develop agendas on priority issues and approach in an inter- uh, multidisciplinary manner, not only from the diversity of social and human science, but also through interactions with other science and with social movement and policy makers. We identify some critical issues. The first one is democracy, human rights and peace. Uh, we need uh, strengthening democracies based on the defense of, of human rights is, that is crucial in the current situation. In pursuit of this goal, social science and humanity must connect with the struggle of diverse Latin American Caribbean social movements, enabling synergies between the outcome of academic research and the knowledge through multiple forms of activism. Second, second note, uh, environment, climate change, and social development. Latin America, as you know, has 40% of global biodiversity. However, a significant portion of its economic activity promotes the use of energy and systems that are really threatening or destroying this biodiversity. This aspect implies considering alternative development models for Latin America and the Caribbean that take into account sustainable use of natural resources and fair transitions planned that do not neglect rights and social justice. Third, migration and human mobility. Human mobility through migration is a socially impactful phenomenon in contemporary reality. Current migration dynamics in the region are increasingly <coughs> diverse and complex. We really need to understand mobility as a human right and to promote different changes in policies that are criminalizing these movements in our region. Four, work and education. We have to add this challenge 
uh, because uh, they are really a complex issue. Uh, we are uh, addressing complex issues in work and education. Inequalities occur and are perpetuated in access to equal and quality <coughs> education, access that is not equitable for everyone, resulting in the perpetuation of this underlying inequality. We have problem in primary, secondary, and university education that not guarantee equitable training and opportunity for everyone in the region. Five, violence and gender inequalities. Uh, as you may know, the situation of women deteriorates day by day in our region. In most countries, they are, women are more exposed to violence and inequality. Uh, we also have conservative and reactionary political sectors that pro proclaim anti-feminist target that they call gender ideology and criminalize the diversity that have gained strength in recent years. We also have a big issue with care. We have no care policies in Latin America and the Caribbean and we are facing really a care crisis with no answer to this. Six, political instability. Uh, we are facing different political instability process. Political crisis reinforce the situations that I mentioned before, weaken public policies and state capability and threaten the development of knowledge, mostly in university and in research institution, either through political restrictions on intellectual freedom or with budget reductions to research in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I think that development studies can play a crucial role in responding, responding sorry, to the frequent interconnect and mutually reinforced crisis that the world is facing and is likely to face in the years to come. Uh, here I, I identify some um, special points that uh, development study can address. The first one is the need of re reinforce interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach. Uh, we really need to adopt an interdisciplinary approach that integrates insight from different fields of knowledge like economic sociology and so on, but also uh, with the knowledge that is coming uh, from the social movements and organization. Then policy analysis and advocacy. I think this is really a crucial issue. Development studies can provide rigorous policy analysis to inform decision makers on effective strategy for responding to the crisis and to prevent future crisis. Third, community engagement and uh, participation. Uh, we should actively engage with local communities, ensuring their active participation in problem sol solving and decision making process. Uh, then, education and capacity building. Also, development studies should focus on education and capacity building, but not only in universities or in academia. We have to uh, build this capacity through uh, or with the social uh, movements and organization. Then global collaboration in an equitable uh, way. Development studies should foster this global uh, cooperation and collaboration. Uh, we have to share knowledge uh, among researchers, practitioners, and policy makers. Uh, that's why uh, in CLACSO, in the Latin American Council for Social Science, as I also said yesterday, we are developing a specific strategy promoting what we call social dialogue platforms in the issues that I mentioned before. That is to say democracy, inequalities, migration, climate change, education, work, gender, and social movements. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Arif, could I ask you to present next? Thank you.
Thank you, Andy. Uh, I have slide, please. Uh, okay. Uh, disclaimer: I'm not really an expert on global affairs, yet maybe I can be kind of good witness or eyewitness of what happened during the recent multiple crises that happened in Indonesia. Uh, the first uh, crisis is the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the crisis in Indonesia, apparently, uh, oh, sorry, I think. Okay. So, COVID-19 crisis kill more than one million people in Indonesia, the third largest after India and Russia. I think I know one. I think one of uh, one out of ten person I know died during COVID, uh, and it also created. A big increase in poverty incidence, especially in those regions which is ground zero <coughs> of COVID. And until today, as you can see on this graph, it hasn't fully recovered until today. So it's created a gap until today, not even close to the pre COVID uh, rate of poverty incidence. And it creates also large inequality. This is in the, especially in the region that was hardest hit, urban area, Java Island. And until today, the index of inequality also still increasing because of more or new crisis after COVID. And it opens the prospect of what I call destructive recovery trajectory. So initially during the pandemic, I mean in the middle of the pandemic, UN institutions coined the term will back better recovery. So use the crisis as an opportunity to improve level of inequality even to the level before COVID-19. I think there's a false hope because what we see here now is the opposite of the building back better recovery. And I call the destructive trajectory recovery, which can result in an equality or a gap, income gap that is even wider than the pre-COVID level. Why? I think for Indonesia and for many other countries in the world, the reason is because the COVID-19 was a perfect storm. So as COVID-19 can be more dangerous because of many comorbidities, I think there are also what I call socioeconomic comorbidities during COVID and that, uh, that is Comorbidity number one, I think, is poverty and vulnerability. People are proud in Indonesia that we are reaching poverty incident that is one digit percentage. But if you increase the threshold, because we are now upper middle income country, actually, this li that line is too low. And then if you are in upper, in upper middle income country, then those poverty level is actually 60.6%. Now, so that's that means those poor people are very exposed to the social economic impact that the crisis uh, will uh, will affect them. <clears throat> Comorbidity number two is high income inequality. Indonesia is actually one of the highest inequality countries in the world. And then comorbidity number three is unfavorable structural transformation because we are in the midst of stall industrialization and and it turn out to be into more uh, low productivity tertiary sessions combined with unplanned or unanticipated urban development planning. And that, uh, the, the one that come with it is you know, formality. So this is not in Indonesia, it is in the world uh, that actually 61.2% labor in, this, in the world, <laughs> the whole thing, higher even in developing country, I think in, employ in, informally. So during the COVID in Jakarta, those who work in Starbucks can be asked not to work during lockdown, but people on the other side, which is selling coffee in bicycle, star bike, they can. Uh, so uh, comorbidity number four is the social prote protection in Indonesia, 
by global standard is low. So we don't invest enough uh, into the social protection. So and I think that also happened in many other countries. This happened or exists despite the fact that actually Indonesia is not a poor country in terms of natural resource, for example, we are rich. And World Bank, for example, map into four cluster of, of how we invest our resource to it. So we may be in the position that we have high capacity to mobilize resource, but low investment in those social infrastructures or B. Uh, I think that's our position there. So because if you can see, for example, here is the example that the more, the, the higher your income per capita, the more you invest in social infrastructure. This is water access. Yeah? But if you plot Indonesian subnational regions, which is actually those who are have authority and invest in social infrastructure, you can see that the variation is large. In the country, in the region where they have high natural resource, they tend to under invest uh, in those social infrastructures. I don't know where the money goes. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so government can fail to invest in, despite enough resource. So anticipating future crisis, then I think it's related to the topic that Andy carry here in this uh, session is that I think we need to eliminate those comorbidities, those economic comorbidities to, be, to anticipate future crisis, which is actually first we have to more progressively eradicate poverty and inequality. We have to reduce uh, poverty and vulnerability. We have to reduce inequality. We have to facilitate favorable structural transformation and also pro uh, perfecting our social protection. Uh, and key to those agenda, I think, is we should focus on equity, not growth only. And think they, are, they already start a massive paradigm shift that equity is not seen as an implications of growth, but as a prerequisite to growth, including in America now under Bidenomics. Uh, and now the second one is we need to seriously empower state capacity, especially fiscal space by more progressive taxation. That's the only way if we want to be a modern society. Uh, and use the taxation revenue to support progressive spending. The last one is we have to keep improving democracy, social contract, institutions, eliminate rent seeking, that's, a, because that's what's happening everywhere in Indonesia and in many other countries, tax evasion, so that we can redirect resources for social infrastructure instead of being captured by the elite. So this is alternate. This is the more priority other than aid, I think. There are opportunity to get this money from inefficiency in the developing world. Uh, another crisis is uh, recent food crisis. This is not Indonesia. I just want to give you um, the, this, the data that puzzle, puzzle, every, puzzle us and puzzle me that for the last decade, number of people under Nuris actually increased by 160 million, despite GDP per capita increase by 16%. This is another uh, uh, crisis. The other crisis, of course, climate crisis. <clears throat> In con the context of Indonesia, we keep continue uh, deforest, deforestation and be becoming a contributor to the global emissions. And this is despite the fact that actually the need to stop deforestation is not really in concern with climate change per se, but because of it, in, it has the economic value to our people in, in the ground. So you know that the value of forests ranging from uh, protection of uh, flood and everything, not only CO2 emission storage. And then <clears throat> uh, this is what happened if you don't really manage uh, your uh, uphill uh, stream, uh, uh, upstream area uh, in the deforestation. So, and this is, I think, the result of, of people that, or we as a system in the capitalism, that confuse between what is expensive and what is valuable. People sometimes confuse about that. So how can we rely on such a system that disregard most things with value? So this is the last slide. <clears throat> uh, so highlight to think about uh, are developing country in poly crisis? But yes, perhaps, but I think maybe it's a series of different kind of crisis with costly socioeconomic impact, as I illustrate to you. So what are the root of this crisis? <clears throat> well, potential for crisis is always there, 
but it may have been anticipated with better resource allocation globally or even nationally. And this is institutional truth, or maybe institutional crisis, you may call it. And the last one is, in terms of the more future generation kind of issues, capitalism also misleading resource allocation because of the signal that the, uh, the, the, the signal that they give to resource allocation is wrong. So what is the role of development studies? I will leave this more up to you all, but I think we should, and development study have a big role to help us understand more the root cause of why we often underinvest in what important in our case for building resilience for crisis. And of course, to propose solutions, particularly I think my personal uh, view is in terms of political economy route to the solution. So I think that end my presentation. Thank you. Can someone help with the PowerPoint? It's a real honor and pleasure to be here at the invitation of EADI conference. Um, I am representing the Asian uh, uh, Political and International Studies Association of PISA, uh, because the president, my colleague Brendan Howe, can't be here because I think they're holding the PISA meeting in Korea right now. Um, I am uh, going to present about, and my uh, title is Surprise! It's the Global South and the Tech or Digital and Gender Gap Again. So it shouldn't come as a huge surprise that this was a problem before and now we're at this um, point with the pandemic and saying, didn't we really know? Shouldn't we have been better prepared? So that's my presentation today. So this is how I'm going to uh, present Turbulent Times and the uh, compounds of digital and gender gap, the fourth industrial revolution, UN sustainable development goals, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that hit us all, the triple challenges that's hitting the global south, a topic that we have been uh, discussed today, way forward uh, for development studies, and uh, my focus of research, which has been on international development cooperation. So here we go. Turbulent times. Uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the, at the Davos Forum, uh, Mr. Schwab talked about the fourth industrial revolution or the digital transformation. I have been working at, with the United Nations on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is to take effect from 2016 to 2030, with the motto of leave no one behind. And the most important thing was to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, along with 16 other goals for economic, social, and environmentally sustainable development. I had the honor of working with 14 other uh, scientists from around the world as part of the independent group of scientists who worked on the 2019 Global Sustainable Development Report. And I'll share with you some of the um, very important uh, findings that we worked on. And then pandemic hit us, and that created havoc, as you all know. So the fourth industrial revolution reminded us that the, the fourth industrial revolution was going to create major changes in all aspects of our lives. AI readiness index, when we look at the data, it looks the darker the, the purple is, uh, shows that the that you are more ready than the countries that are low and lighter in purple. And it's very clear who's ready and who's not. Uh, one of the most serious problems that I saw when I looked at the that uh, purple map is the brain drain from the global south to the global north. Some of the very important statistics was that the global um, south was providing some of the 
uh, very skilled labor force and, and people to the global north, primarily to North America. Um, and we were seeing a very serious brain drain from the global south to the global north. Average wages of the ICT employees are significantly higher in high-income countries. All countries except high-income countries are experiencing large outflows of skilled ICT workers. And then let's look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And as I said, Agenda 2030, the most important was to remember, leave no one behind, is to make sure that uh, with the MDGs, we were trying to reduce extreme poverty by half of the 1990 figures. By 2030, we want to make sure that at least extreme poverty was eradicated from, from Earth. However, where are we? In the uh, 2019 GSDR report, the Global Sustainable De Development Report that we, we worked on, there were four areas in which we were going backwards in terms of SDGs attainment for 2030. And these four very prominent areas was rising inequalities, climate change, biodiversity loss, and ecological footprints, the garbage that we were throwing out into the ocean. Now, these four areas we saw with data were not only going slow in terms of meeting our 2030 uh, uh, deadline, but we're actually going backwards. So we felt already in 2019 that unless we take immediate action to turning back the tides, we're not gonna reach the 2030 goals. And uh, when we presented this to the UN Secretary General at the September meeting in 2019, we were all getting ready to do the global, uh, the 15 of us who are assigned to do global presentations, but when 2020 uh, uh, COVID-19 hit us, uh, I think I did February and then I couldn't do anymore. This was for me the most significant map that we saw uh, worked on in the Global uh, Sustainable Development Report 2019. This map represents the R&D gap and the most significant uh, issue was the concentration of R&D in the global north vis-a-vis -vis the global south. The UN officials were so concerned about releasing this map that they at first did not allow us to include this in the report. At the end, they allowed us to include it as long as we removed the names of the countries. But you all know <laughs> where you are. But the, the stark, message from this is the concentration in the global north and in the a few countries. And the other thing is that uh, the R&D investments were from primarily from the private sector. So it was not for the global public goods. So this map showed very clearly where the concentration was and what was the investment, R&D investment for. Now, the gender gap that we saw very problematic, gender as a cross-cutting issue was showing up in all areas and gender inequality was very serious uh, in terms of wage gaps, in terms of uh, women in management positions, uh, high political uh, positions, and so on. So we saw a gender gap and gender inequality as cross-cutting in all areas. COVID-19 pandemic hit the world and it appeared that the digital gap widened between the global north and the global south. Cost of internet use was getting more expensive in the global south vis-a-vis -vis the global north because not because the cost itself was going up but because the relative income in the global south was becoming smaller vis-a-vis -vis the global north. So the access to internet and the usage of uh, digital uh, uh, services was getting much more expensive in the global north with COVID. The gender gap worsened uh, with the pandemic, and this was across the world, not just in countries where, like in Korea, where there was still very much uh, 
patriarchal uh, cultural systems, but this was statistically significant around the world where the care uh, burden or care responsibility was largely taken up by women. Some people say voluntarily, I said, fine, but the reward should be shared. And when women were falling behind in their jobs because of uh, the care responsibility, this has to be taken up seriously by the society. And then the extreme poverty and health in inequality increased dramatically during the COVID period. Global extreme poverty rate increased for the first time since the 1990s, and the statistics are very alarming. Health inequality increased dramatically during uh, the COVID period. The vaccine access and vaccine affordability as compared to the high-income countries where uh, nearly 70% of people were vaccinated, only less than 12% of the people were vaccinated in low-income countries. My area of interest, international development cooperation, official development assistance from uh, developed countries uh, decreased during the pandemic. There were some ups and downs, but nonetheless, even with the increase, it did not meet the need in created by COVID-19. So where do we go from here? Way forward for development studies and for international development cooperation. I think these cannot be separated. First of all, international organizations broke down during the early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. WO was, uh, at least in the first phase, was lost between the US and China rivalry. The UN leadership was not effective. They were not uh, uh, visible. Third, you know, before we used to talk about universal health coverage, UHC was a word, the acronym that we heard a lot around the WHO and around the UN about universal health coverage, which talked about the affordability and access of medicine and medical care to everyone. That word was not heard during the pandemic. Uh, multi and bilateral cooperation broke down with lockdown when countries were locking their doors uh, and the support for developing countries of the global south was unavailable. Uh, Earlier speakers talked about um, multi uh, challenges for developing countries during the pandemic. I talk about the triple challenges, low amounts of official development uh, um, assistance. Global North affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Compared to other previous pandemics, uh, COVID-19 affected the global north as much as it did the global south. So the global north, for, for reasons of protecting their own citizens, uh, could not or couldn't for political reasons as well, uh, do a lot of ODA or support developing countries. So they, we saw a decline in ODA. Second, the overall weak global economy, low trade, low foreign direct investment, low tourism, low labor migration remission, all affected the global south much more than it affected the global north, which was heavily dependent on labor migration, heavily, many countries depended on heavily on, on tourism and so on. The breakdown of the global public health system and testing, vaccines, medicine, medical assistance, these were affecting the global south much more than the global north, and they are not able to recover from COVID-19. So some of these uh, challenges are maybe short term, but many of them are having long term consequences and we need to address them as a global community. So international development cooperation in particular for digital and gender equality in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. ODA and R&D for the global south to improve the digital and gender gap I think is really critical. The only way I think out of this is to support higher education in the Global South. Working in the UN circles, uh, they keep saying providing elementary education, to, uh, uh, primary education in the Global South is critical. Fine. We did that with MDGs. We finally agreed to provide secondary education as, as uh, critical. We did that uh, in the middle of the MDGs and we're continuing with that in the SDGs. 
but we're not able to agree that tertiary education or higher education is also very fundamentally critical for the Global South's sustainable development. Unless we support higher education in the Global South, the dependency of the Global South to the Global North will not cease. The brain drain will not cease. It will even uh, uh, become exacerbated as we have seen with the AI and with the STEM and with the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, support, uh, so, uh, for example, support for STEM education, workforce for women and girls. These are some issues that I think need immediate attention. Finally, I think SDGs are still relevant in spite of all these changes, in spite of um, COVID-19. And finally, in line with the, the theme of this conference, global research action partnership networking among the global northern and global southern colleges, universities, academic associations, and students is a key for sustainable development re uh, research, uh, for sustainable development and enduring peace. So great job for EADI. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Andy, um, Susanna, and the ADI for inviting me here to this conference to, to share some of my thoughts about the topic of the day. My name is Rebecca Richard Pleike. I'm based at the University of South Africa, and I'm here representing also the South African Development Studies Association. So to start off my talk, my talk is actually entitled The Crisis of Development and Development Studies in particular as the theme of the, the, this panel in the turbulent times in African philosophical perspective by first stating the obvious. And to me, this obvious is that development in whichever form it is understood requires the existence of human persons to whom development will be directed. This suggesting that the preservation of life is the foremost necessary condition for development to declare itself one, or the condition which development must foster to be able to, to recognize itself. In this respect of life preservation, development for me acquires a universal moral standard, which I would want to believe becomes universal at least at a personal level, and for its survival would require some form of satisfaction of basic necessities such as food, health for, for all people across the world, according, of course, to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I believe this is the fundamental point at which a consensus about development is achieved without much debate. Beyond this principle of preservation of life, development becomes an ideology. This is where the ideological space begins to, to, to exist. And of course, this has been infused by ideas such as standpoint theory and Tandon and many people working on this idea of development as, as ideology, okay? And this is the space that becomes fused with varying value systems, social, economic, and historical experiences of human beings from very different vantage points all of which have been the source of sharp differences, competition amongst nations, and mostly a source of unmitigated conflict in the history of humankind. This is the politics and the space at which development becomes ideological. It is a tricky and a very complex space that one needs to navigate very carefully if we are to cross-negotiate that with the universal principle of preservation of life. I'd like to put this on hold for a while, uh, and we'll talk about it much later. So if we accept development to fall within the realm of the ideological, then it is reasonable to argue that development therefore becomes an artifact of philosophy, a particular worldview and its cognition, right? And in our history, we know that 
Development has been therefore under the spell of Western philosophy and epistemological paradigm. This is the philosophy that has been well documented from Aristotle, René Descartes, Descartes, to Hegel, to Immanuel Kant, all of whom have variously justified Eurocentrism, conquest, colonialism, and inaugurated what Gross Fugel ultimately claims to be, and I quote, a Euro-American centric, Christian centric, sexist, patriarchal, heteronormative power structure of the world system, which we continue to live under through coloniality and what uh, uh, Nkrumah would have said is neo-colonialism. This would be the world, as we have known, that would experiment projects such as the Enlightenment, industrialization and Western modernity, capitalism, structural adjustment programs, globalization, and now recently artificial intelligence, all of which are understood to be markers of development, with Europe, of course, being the center. There's, there's a lot of work that has been happening of this, and I do not want to bore you with such details. All these exploratory ideas have been, you know, put out there as markers either of development and signs of success. However, from where we stand, uh, this idea of Western philosophy and its epistemological paradigm have allowed to bear unto humanity what Amos Cisse believes to be what he quotes, and I quote, a decadent civilization, a civilization of death, and a civilization that is incapable of resolving its very own problems. This is a civilization that do not, does not have the moral authority to claim to invent himself. This is what Cisse would, 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 would put out there. And a recent example to this is with this Russia-Ukraine war, for example where in which for the first time we've seen African heads of state traveling to Russia trying to mitigate, you know, between two European war infections. Uh, as to the effect of that, we do not know, but it's quite symbolic uh, 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 somehow to us. And there have been quite a lot of people who have been working on these ideas, especially showing the deleterious effect that development itself has had on the countries of the global north. We have the likes, of uh, uh, Franz Fanon, who's globally known, uh, Robert Ramose, Achille Bembe, Joa Ventura de Sousa, who's here in Portugal, Tandikam Kandawiri, Mahmoud Mamdani, Ima Mama, Issa Shivji, Samir Yamin, and many other African and Latin American scholars who have documented how these things have, this decadence has actually happened, and especially how it affected African countries. And these problems have stretched from epistemicides, debasement of Africans from ontological self, to escalating problems of racism, nationalism slash ultra-nationalism, chauvinism, chauvinism, xenophobia globally, to rising levels of unemployment, poverty, and overconsumption. And now recently to the problem of climate change amongst many others, which the global South is facing more in particular. This is the space of human crisis that development studies find itself in. With itself, by origin and intent, being part of this historical problem of epistemicide, chauvinism is Western philosophical and epistemological paradigm, which Cisse has reminded us about. This is the history of development studies has been actually documented as well, the genealogy of development studies, with this intention being one that would train graduates who would go into the colonial world and administer using British Western models in terms of the administration of the, of the colonial state post-independence. Okay. There's many, Gilbert Rist and many others have actually weighed on this issue, pointing out precisely to these and many other problems that development studies slash international development has been and its complicity to these problems. I do, however, believe, welcome, in particular efforts that have been made thus far with development studies in creating consciousness about these challenges and its complicity of Western thought and paradigm and its limit within these. The panel discussion under the theme development studies in turbulent times, understanding and responding in the crisis, in the age of crisis, is a very good example of this effort of consciousness, including the conscious team, 
uh, conference theme towards the new rhythms of development, which signifies the necessity for development mainstreaming uh, studies to, to be alive to the rhythms that have been pre precluded from influencing mainstream thinking in development. It is my view, therefore, that consciousness of the prevailing problems of development, it is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to liberate development. This is because development and development studies still has it's got its own structural problems, both internally and externally, which, needs to, which it needs to contend with. Key amongst this being the crisis of legitimacy, especially within the intellectual space in the global south, from where I come from. And this has allowed, and this, due to its legitimacy, the, the crisis owing due to its historical uh, genealogy, you know. Uh, this has actually been one thing that has been fueling a criticism about development, including its continued silence on the problems of race, which were well problematized in the discipline as early as 2000 by Sarah White in 2006 by Professor Makotari, she's here, maybe she can appraise the process, and Marcus Power amongst others who have argued for mainstreaming race theory in development and development studies. 19 years down the line, development studies has not had any impact on the race question in lecture halls, especially, or elsewhere in our field where I come from, especially. We don't speak race in the classroom. Uh, instead, we are witnessing a pushback with race consciousness being considered itself racism. At this very juncture, African philosophy of Ubuntu, for example, and Latin American philosophy such as Buen Vivir have not made it through the register of development studies, even when these philosophies have been appropriated in various ways in development discourse. For example, the concept of that have just recently entered the, the lexicon of development studies and development generally of sustainable development it's only recent, and yet these concepts belong to the age-old ideas that are found in African philosophy of Ubuntu in its conception of being, which exists, structure of being, which is triontic, and it exists at three levels, the living, the dead, and those yet to become, and the necessity to maintain balance for the survival of life and human being. The same principle is also found found within the philosophy of the Latin American philosophy of Wayne Bibin, where in which balance is also a, 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 a more of, you know, what is a, a requirement for the survival of, of, of human beings. Until today, African philosophies are largely absent in the debate on agricultural development in, in Africa. The natural question would be under this critique, why do Europeans, why, why should Europeans take these ideas very seriously if Africans themselves, I mean, it's a moral duty of African intellectuals to do this thing. I'd, I would want to treat that matter uh, at a later stage, perhaps, if we still have more time. But by and large, herein lies the core crisis of development studies. That is the crisis of commitment to its own transformation by opening up to the pluriversal world. It is this lack of commitment of development studies to transform in real terms, which I believe extinguishes possibilities of its legitimacy widely and fuels pessimism in certain quarters of the post-development world, some of whom are arguing for decolonization, with some proposing even the dissolution of development studies in total. One recent example of this is through the recycling of concepts and giving them new meaning in the grammar of development discourse. One such concept we had is modernity, now gravitating towards the idea of transformative modernity, positive modernity, or even liberatory modernity in an attempt to sanitize and give it this new concept a new life. The continued use of this concept, even in sanitized form, is an indication of a desperate desperation for relevance on the part of Western epistemology and concluded preclusion of other voices in development enterprises. More importantly, this signifies the default 
by default rather, the power of white supremacy and Eurocentrism, even within projects wanting to decolonize it. All right? Why do we have to reappropriate meanings when we can simply search for other words or fresher words that are less traumatizing, expressing the linguistic articulation of progress outside the words of Europe, main European languages and so on. There are also other challenges, by the way, not only within development studies, but also from the outside arising from issues of representation even within the global south those who want to be included this is pointed out again by martin linda alkoff in her essay entitled problems of speaking for others which cannot be discounted in this debate for those who seek epistemic justice and wants representation within development and development studies and this challenge is best explained by way of a question which i'd like to phrase as, as follows to what extent are the voices of the excluded groups truly represented when their interlocutors have been imbibed in Western sensibilities through Western education systems? Okay? This critique is linked very closely to the idea of African universities versus universities in Africa. There's a radical distinction there, with one suggesting that the universities in Africa our universities in Africa are not necessarily African universities because they are teaching from a particular historical and a philosophical point of view. We have universities in Africa, but not African universities. So that's the distinction. How do we represent these things? To stretch this question even further, I would also like to question, can Caliban, the Subaltern, the Efulefu, the Utemension, or the Kafir, speak is he capable of speaking truth about his wants and the under the prevailing power structures of the hegemony of this world that we have inherited further to this challenge is the question of whether the global south represent a homogeneous group between and within nations in in the world that is increasingly marked by hybrid forms of existence acculturation transculturation currents and, and, and this is the point where in which I, I want to move in a particular direction uh, of sameness, which I think I will speak if I don't have time. Yeah, look, time. Which I think I will, I, will, I, will, I will try to speak to, unity in sameness. Um, because I also truly believe that uh, the, the idea of difference and politicized difference has no place in development. But we will come to that. I want to believe that all the problems and pretenses of development and development studies still offers us the opportunity to liberate humanity. And this will require serious commitments to transformation, which will be marked amongst others by refocusing development to fundamental questions. And these are the questions of humanity. And to quote one scholar, the question that we need to contend with is what fundamentally does it mean to be human these are human questions which i believe development studies should be contending with and flowing from this question will be a natural requirement for us to rehumanize development in ways that are universal to humankind and with this i'd like to make these following proposals these are by no means conclusive. They can be contested. It's just rough ideas that one is putting through. The elevation of the centrality of human life. And I want to use human life very carefully here. By human life, I mean appropriating the concept of the anthropocentric. No. The elevation of the centrality of human life within the context articulated through the philosophy of Ubuntu One and Buenos Vivir, where in balance, we are not having an over-representation of the human over every other species. Let life be the main category for which development itself wants to, to do. The second point would be the elevation of sameness above difference. And in this respect, I would like to 
I would have to have a way with, 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 with Stuart's Colbridge uh, idea of the double commitment of development studies being committed to both difference and sameness. Uh, I, would, I would rather say we need to elevate sameness. Development should not be committed to difference, but rather to sameness. Because conceptually, I have, an idea, I have a problem with the idea of difference, especially in a, in a multicultural, hybridized form of life, because the idea of difference arises from ideas of identities, many of which Bernard, Benedict Anderson has told us that they are imagined, and, and, and the ideas of identity very much uh, they cannot exist outside claims of some forms of puritanism, which is pureness, a concept which I really do not believe in, that there's anything that is pure. But nevertheless, I would go in to accept that perhaps maybe it's time to elevate a, a, a sameness rather than difference. Epistemic justice and development of the new grammar for development and development studies. New concept, new language is necessary. And this, by nature, becomes the ontological invitation for collaboration. You cannot search for solutions within very narrow, singular, epistemic paradigms. We need to share the language. New concepts, let them play out. Old concepts that did not work, let's abandon them, because they tend to come with their own psychological impact in their work. And fourthly and lastly, I would propose that development studies, we should try to depoliticize difference wherever it exists. Because for me, this is the site of many conflicts, many of which we have seen. Um, and perhaps as we approach and try to treat this with an earnest, we may come close to what may be termed development studies of liberation. Thank you very much. So a very big thank you to all the speakers. That was very, very interesting and thought provoking. Um, just to summarize a little bit before we open for questions, we've heard a uh, perspective from Latin America on the crisis and the implications for development studies in terms of transdisciplinarity, policy advocacy, uh, local participation in education, uh, perspective from Indonesia, focusing on economic co-mobilities and a particularly interesting question about the role of development studies where the lack of resources isn't the issue the resources are there but i mean it, it sounds like what you find in <laughs> in a developed country the resources are there but they're just not used to deal with the social issues that sounds very familiar to me coming from the from a uk perspective um uh, a perspective uh, on the sort of digital inequality and gender inequality and particularly the sustainable development goals and the implications for development studies around global partnerships, higher education and, uh, uh, and building those things. And a perspective from South Africa on ethics and philosophy, uh, challenging and the complicity and uh, the, the legitimacy of development studies talking about issues about um, rehumanizing development and development studies, uh, thinking more about sameness and, and how, to, how to engage with that, thinking more about new language and new concepts, and uh, the need to kind of open up development studies much more and think about those aspects of, of social justice. So I think we have, um, we have about 40 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I'd like to invite the audience to, uh, to have the first round of questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, and then at the back. Thank you so much. I'd like to be very much grateful to all of you for those thought-provoking submissions. I actually have got a lot of questions, but I think I'm going to just have one, but uh, it has been actually necessitated by the presentation done by Yun. I hope I got your name right. So I think when I was following your presentation, 
towards the end, you proposed some of the things that you thought should be done. And part of the suggestion was that we need to support higher education as a way of trying to stop brain drain. I totally agree with you, but I also want also to challenge you in terms of the possible contradictions that are in those submissions, in the sense that earlier on you had also talked about how people with IT skills have often been moving away from their home countries in search of greener pastures. So how then are we going to strike a balance between the promotion of STEM education and the unavailability of better remuneration in their home countries? I assume that if you invest in STEM education, skills gotten up, they obviously become also motivated to move away is what is happening uh, in the current scenario. So how do you strike a balance in such uh, an arena? It's for you, but anyone else who would want also to pitch up uh, in it, it will be so interesting to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Balash? Hi, um, thank you very much to all of you. Brilliant, thought provoking. Um, I'm bad at like, you know, remembering names. So if I say first, second, third, and fourth speakers, I hope you'll forgive me, all right? So I'm just trying to. My question is um, to the final speaker, please. Um, what you have proposed um, is um, personally, it resonates with like, you know, so many amazing stuff, really. But I would also hope that possibly you can predict, especially from third speaker's point of view, that you know, we are going backwards, that it might be dismissed by some people or some powerful actors of the global development as an utopia. So I'll keep the question simple. What are the challenges you envisage to implement the suggestions you have made? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one or two others in this round? Uh, yes. Everybody wants to repolitize everything. So, could you please elaborate a bit on that? How you understand that? Thank you. Uh, perhaps we have time for one more. Yes. And then we can come back for a, a second round in a few moments. Uh, hello, and thank you for your presentations. I've got a question concerning the so-called readiness of artificial intelligence that was on the map. And I would like to question the desirability of artificial intelligence when, as other presenters showed, there is also a, a big lag in basic needs, first and foremost. Like, should artificial intelligence be a priority when some people still struggle with meeting basic needs? Thank you. Okay, um, in terms of coming back to the panel, maybe we could take it in turns and you can res respond to the points raised. Uh, Arif, would you like to go first? Yeah, uh, okay. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember them all now. So there's one there's one question on um, on sort of how to uh, depoliticize depoliticize difference. How do we depoliticize difference when actually many people want to politicize difference? There was one question on should we focus so much on artificial intelligence when many people in the world have you know such substantial widespread poverty. But should, should, we be, should we be focusing on artificial intelligence when many people in the world don't have basic needs? Mm, they're focusing on R&D. Um, and uh, help me out someone. <laughs> uh, we had the, the question at the back, which I think was to Sabike, yeah? Uh, can you just repeat it because it, sorry? Okay, what would be the challenges to what's being proposed? Uh, what are the challenges to implementing what you've proposed? Okay, and 
<laughs> there was one other question. Sorry, this is what happens when you have four or five days of conferencing. My, your brain just loses its short-term memory. All right, I, I'll try to repeat it again. But I mean, um, I was asking around uh, what I sort of found as a contradiction from the proposals that were made by Yun towards the end. At one point, she proposed that we need to have an investment uh, in higher education with also specific, to specific focus towards STEM as a way of also trying to manage brain drain, right? But initially in her, present, in her presentation, she had also indicated how a lot of people with IT skills have also been on an exodus, leaving their home countries to go in search of greener pastures. So now my question to you was, how are we going to strike a balance between investing in STEM education, whereas you don't have the social base or social construction that will keep the same people and minimize brain drain? I hope it's clear now. Thank you. Okay. How, how should we think about the kind of balance between investing in higher education and broader social questions or the, con or the construction of, or is a construction of knowledge question? Okay, okay. So particularly this issue about people will it, in some ways inevitably want to try and find their best chances and that might entail leaving countries. So how should we think about that or what are the kind of responses? So uh, people may wish to try and find their best chances in life and so that may entail, may entail moving country. How would we address, uh, yeah, for, for a, a better quality of life or other reasons and how you know how should we think about you know a, a kind of reasons why people would want to want to sort of stay if their life chances are better elsewhere okay thank you very much uh, Arif if I come to you first okay <clears throat> thank you uh, let me attempt to uh, comments or uh, of the four questions i think all the four questions is somehow related including the last one this desirability of uh, artificial intelligence because it is related to the first one which is it affect our education system including higher education but also it affect jobs quality that may be displaced by this new technology so in terms of higher educations i think that I understand that it is necessary for higher education to serve as a vehicle for socio-economic mobility for people. Uh, but I think in the context of this development, higher education cannot be separated from the overall research ecosystem. So it's not only higher education, but research ecosystem in itself. So it means it has to be related to how much money the government invest on R&D and on research, which is quite low in developing country, in Indonesia particularly, even we have potential to invest more. So that's my, my comments to that. And then the challenge that, what challenge to implement all of those suggestions, I think it's related to the third question that also you raised, which is depoliticizing or repolitizing, because in my view, the biggest challenge of this is political economy. Always, always. It's the politics of this. That's the biggest challenge. And if you have more direct planning approach in development like China or Singapore, in one way or another, maybe it's you are in a better situation. But in, in a country like Indonesia, who are recently becoming a democracy, a not yet mature democracy, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, so, and, and that's, I think, uh, so I, I, I really look forward to, to the more discussion about this political economy from one other speakers. I think that's my take. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those very good questions. First of all, um, the reason why I showed you both the global north and global south in terms of the R&D gap and the goals that we have for sustainable development and the fourth industrial revolution is to point out that um, the fourth industrial revolution is really presenting a, a, a very important um, a challenge that 
if if we're not um, in trading for STEM and AI, we're going to really fall behind. The trend with the AI and STEM is um, the inequality will rise inexorably if we don't get into STEM and AI, and it, it appears that that's going to, to exacerbate the inequality. So what I would like to suggest is not do a zero sum with do I uh, uh, provide uh, f funding and opportunities for STEM vis-a-vis -vis social protection for <coughs> poverty and, and uh, for, um, for hunger, is we need to expand the support for the Global South in the time, for the time being to make sure that uh, there is enough support for higher education and for STEM and AI in particular, so that the Global South does not fall behind beyond repair. We of course have to support the Global South in terms of social protection, but I'm saying that if we don't invest in and support the Global South in higher education and STEM and AI, the inequality will rise in exponential terms compared to the third or second industrial revolution. So that's the danger that I see that we need to do both. So maybe the support for the Global South has to be expanded beyond ODA and that's I think very clear. So I wouldn't take, you know, this is one single pie we need to divide whether we have to prioritize STEM vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, poverty reduction and support for, uh, for hunger programs. I, I really disagree with that dichotomy. Uh, second, in terms of the labor migration and supporting those individuals who want to improve their economic lot by migrating to the north. Um, I'm not disagreeing with that, but those people who would like to return to their home countries to contribute, because of the, um, the concentration, that extreme concentration of ICT in the Global South, because of that concentration of higher education in STEM and whatever fields in the Global South, even if you wanted to go back, you cannot go back. And that's the structural inequality that I would like to address. Not, I'm not trying to stifle the individuals wish to go and work wherever one would like to go, but it is the structural inequality that I see as problematic and that appears to be much more singularly concentrated in the global south into a very few number of countries compared to previous industrial revolutions. Finally, in terms of higher education, um, I've been working at the United Nations circles and uh, doing a lot of work. And the, the minute I talk about higher education, they say it's very important to provide primary education and secondary education. But when they, when we talk about higher education in the global south, they say, oh, it's a luxury. And I say, it's not a luxury. We have to do primary and secondary education for sure. But without higher education, uh, this, this, um, sustainable development, I think, is, is going to be very difficult because with secondary education, trained individuals, uh, you're not, it's going to be very difficult to, to continue with national development. It's not going to be uh, possible to do the kind of R&D investments that you need to do and so on and so forth. So I think uh, the Global North has to, has to support the higher education in the Global South in a much more uh, systematic way than, than it has been willing to do in the past. Um, thank you so much uh, for this question um, on, on depoliticizing uh, difference. Uh, maybe I should have just warned before that is extremely difficult to answer theoretical questions with practical solutions. So <laughs> it's very extremely difficult. But uh, nevertheless, what, what I want to say is that, I mean, the reality is that um, this is a civilization that we have 
we are witnessing. This is a civilization in which we live in. These, the fact of difference is part of the problematic that MEC say states out to say this is a decadent civilization. We find ourselves in a world that exists in dichotomies, you know, uh, in dualism, some form of dualism. The, 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 you know, uh, in, in, in some form of seeing difference, in elevating difference more. But personally, I believe <clears throat> uh, we cannot avoid this, this, uh, this reality and the world in which we live in. But personally, I believe difference, however it may be identified, has been abused to a point that we see difference as, you know, the starting point of existence. And this is not the fact. We can make very simple examples. Uh, I mean, we live in Africa. We've seen how ethnicities have been mobilized politically to lead to, you know, very difficult and very, you know, uh, bad situations. Uh, wars have been, you know, uh, uh, fueled through these types of differences. And when you look at it, I mean, you in, in Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis, we've seen it everywhere, where there's no, there's absolutely no different ontologically between these people, except the fact that they believe he is Hutu and he is uh, uh, whatever. But there is no proof and nor can it be scientifically proven to say that you are this or you are not, you know. So, so these are differences that I'm saying they've been abused that needs to be managed. And perhaps what needs to happen is to elevate sameness uh, in general. It's not going to be an easy thing. But if you ask me how we can manage that in development studies, that is something else. Um, but I truly believe, um, you know, we are more common than different, I believe, because even some of these identities, you know, uh, they are not scientific, they are not true, they are, f they, they are imaginaries that people have. Uh, they, are, they are not concrete especially in the world today that is just, you know, informed by the idea of motion, movement, and so on. Yeah, so I think we should drop it. Uh, it's, it's difficult. I don't know how to, but it's certainly something to imagine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will uh, start by, by saying that maybe we have to uh, have a focus on... on pay more attention to the political dimension of everyday life. What we uh, say, uh, say in Spanish, uh, vida cotidiana, everyday life, and the political dimension that we can find there, because maybe analyzing this, uh, we can find some answers for the questions that were raised here. Uh, I think after the, the pandemic, this was Obviously, I believe in this before the, the pandemic, but after the pandemic, this was really clear for us. Um, if if we took this, uh, if we take sorry this perspective, um, we have an example in Latin America is what we are discussing now, and we name it the care society, putting life in the center, putting care in different ways of discussing and seeing um, uh, care, but we name it the care society that we need to, to build um, in our region. Um, obviously, this need uh, that we focus on equity uh, and that we discuss um, things with life uh, in the center. And we also need to improve, as it was said here by other panelists, the state capacity, uh, the state capacity in order to uh, push for this uh, change and this transformation in social contracts. We need to improve democracy. And there I want to insist once again that for really improving democracy and especially participatory democracy, what we need is social watch or citizen uh, watch and participation uh, to push, uh, to push uh, democracy to another level that is really need in, uh, I think in the global south, but I will at least 
uh, say it for Latin America, because now we have this kind of capture uh, democracies in many countries, and I think social work on citizen participation can be one of the answers. Thank you. Sorry, like, oh. go on. <laughs> go on. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll go for a second round of questions just before we do. Um, I'm thinking about all this. Uh, what what does it mean for ERD, or what does it mean for research and teaching associations? Um, and so, as we go to another round of questions, it would be really nice to hear your thoughts on what are the implications of the discussion for ERD or any academic association, but particularly ERD, because we have, obviously we have special responsibility for ERD's uh, direction and future, all of us. Um, uh, so what might be the implications of the discussion for uh, research networks like ERD, research and teaching networks, or what might be the priorities? Uh, what would be really nice is if we can come up with, if you're able to come up with one or two concrete things that ERD ought to be either doing uh, or starting a process of discussion about what the association might do about it or who should we be talking to who should we try and bring together you know some kind of it'd be really interesting to hear some we've heard quite a bit about higher education particularly higher education in the global south in different ways um, we've heard a bit about global collaboration we've talked a bit about uh, in many countries it's not the lack of resources it's the politics and particularly as you've referred to uh, depoliticizing difference uh, in the way in many countries in in the north and the south uh, it's the politicization of difference that actually sort of uh, you know lets the bad guys get away with it um, uh, and also this interesting this sort of angle about the the politics of everyday life and bringing how we bring that into a, a or the Dehumanizing of development and recentering of life and care, or the care society, which I like. It sounds. It sounds really. It sounds fantastic. Um, uh, uh, and sort of underline all of this is sort of the kind of massive question about demographic, uh, uh, democratic deficits, and how democracies, as we heard from Shalini uh, uh, in the keynote, have been captured um, not through outright. Uh, authoritarian or, or but a kind of a kind of soft capture of imagination uh, of people's imagination that someone in their country or outside is the enemy uh, and uh, that kind of creating of that uh, or the politicization of difference uh, so that uh, the, the democracy slips towards a kind of soft authoritarianism um, let's open up for another round of questions from the floor. Uh, you may have noticed I was ad libbing to give you a chance to think up questions. Okay, uh, if we can take maybe at least two or three or four questions, we'll come back to the panel and then we'll wrap up after that point. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the uh, very interesting uh, presentations and uh, new insights. Um, so Professor Youssef uh, mentioned uh, four uh, comorbidities and uh, Professor Kim uh, mentioned the various gaps uh, we are discussing again and again. So in my view, uh, the persistence of these uh, gaps and morbidities, which the development studies has been engaging with from the very beginning, um, it is because uh, we are working within the constraints that are already built into the global political economy. And how can we uh, push for a radical transformation of the global political economic structures? Uh, and this is an important question I think uh, ARD should continue to, to push for and push forward. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So how how should those working in development studies uh, be pushing for a, a radical transformation of the global political economy okay other questions yes yes thank you very much for your presentation just in line with that 
Uh, you were mentioning soft authoritarianism, where we had a presentation on a couple of days back. I was just wondering, you were talking about indeed, uh, or your pleas for taking a political econo economy standpoint or the call for uh, thinking about sameness. How should we place that in a situation of increasing soft authoritarianism in some of the countries where you, you, you do your work? I think maybe in Indonesia you may see some of these tendencies as well, maybe in South Africa or, well, uh, elsewhere. Do you, do you see these tendencies and is that somehow sort of impacting your work or your space to speak out not only in these places where you find an audience that well, might agree or disagree, but at least, you know, we, we can talk about it. Or, uh, like, outside in other spaces that might be more hostile to such ideas, indeed. So what are the counter trends, so to say, and do you experience them yourself? Thank you. So the question is, uh, do you see these tendencies towards soft authoritarianism? Uh, uh, and, and does it affect your work? And I guess, how do you, how do you experience it and how do you, how do you try and deal with it? Um, Isa. Let me add a, a, a little bit more to the mixture, if uh, you'll allow me. When we talked about soft authoritarianism uh, a day or two ago, one of the main issues was the decrease and the exclusion of different types, say different groups of people from from actually being citizens. And so th my question is, how do you look at the decrease, the exclusion of citizenship and or the inclusion of citizenship processes in the kind of suggest the suggestions that you're putting forward? The second point, if I may, is that uh, Ayadi is research and training indeed, but also very much engaging with policy, policy makers. So a question to all of you is, how do we do that more effectively? And what kind of strategies, because we know it's a very long-term process with its ups and downs and uh, no guarantees for final success um, that you keep having to push at it. So how do we deal with that as a process in its own right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So there's, there's the first question is about soft, soft authoritarianism, particularly the uh, uh, exclusion of some citizens as a kind of the, the creation of political difference, as you referred to. Kind of, I don't know if you can talk about de de-citizenizing, but anyway, um, the inclusion or exclusion of specific social groups in order to create uh, you know the, uh, a sense of otherness um, and the second about ERD uh, one of the things we would like to do and have done but we want to build on it is to do much more policy and advocacy work uh, and so if you have any any advice on thinking about those kind of questions from your own experience uh, as is a points towards it's a it's a long run uh, goal because uh, but in in the short term of course there's things we can do but you know the, the kind of structures we're dealing with really are as a, a long-run project uh, but any advice any advice to the association would be from your own experiences and your own perspectives uh, from different parts of the world would be really useful um there's i think there's probably a chance for one more question before we come back to the panel uma Um, thanks very much um, to, to all the panel. I think that was really interesting. Um, my question might come as a bit of a, a sort of surprise to, um, to people who know me, because I'm always sort of challenging and critiquing development and development studies. Um, but my friends hopefully will agree that I've mellowed as I've got older. And so my question is about sort of where are things working? Where do you see hope? Where do you see certain spaces in which progressive, creative, active um, work is, is taking place. So I think you've, all of you have identified um, really well and, and deeply and thoughtfully around what the challenges are about turbulence and crisis. Um, but what, what's happening at the level of convivial culture in daily everyday life 
where people are coming together and they're doing very progressive and very creative things that we can support more. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is, is where do you see hope or where do you see progressive movements, things that development studies or Eardian research associations can engage with? Uh, I mean, recently, Eardi had a, a, a webinar uh, related to a concept of critical hope uh, in terms of teaching students not only a a critique of the world but learning from their experiences to try and find ideas or reimagining or ways of reimagining the world from, from the students point of view uh, and that was very interesting based on their uh, a book that came out recently um no more questions yep okay so uh, arif if i can ask you first thank you and again i think all of this five question is uh, related to each other uh, maybe uh, first is about the constraint global political economy uh, maybe someone else can comment on that but i think uh, we can always try to see internal opportunity for resource mobilization too inside of uh, global political economy and uh, IRD maybe can have a research program on on this. I mean, how to increase mobilization of resource in developing country. In Indonesia, as I remember, out of 300, almost 300 million people, only nine people register to file income tax, for example. <clears throat> only nine million. So we have a lot of potential on this too, and we can learn from uh, many countries. And uh, soft authoritarian, authoritarian and i think you spot it on i mean uh, last week uh, nature conservation biology published uh, an article about how a researcher in netherlands uh, was were abandoned to come to indonesia to do research about orangutan because the conflicting numbers of population of orangutan in kalimantan becoming uh, an uh, the dislike by the government, and I, I, I'm, I'm having a collaboration, research collaboration with with researcher with uh, uh, Denmark uh, through Danida, and for now every researcher from every researcher that want to do research in Indonesia has to go a lot of bureaucracy to be given research permit to come in. So it's there, and what is the reason? I think political motivation too and I can see the I can see the, the 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 strategy is can be very effective because among academic in Indonesia majority are at the margin of saying and not saying and margin a lot of margin and the margin there are a few minim, uh, minority that that are more 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 active but they are in the margin and these people are in the margin it's easy to to kick away just by example because there are one or two example for example uh, of your my friend and their whatsapp or hijack by i don't know who and that's enough to stop other what to do to say something for example it happens <coughs> uh, unfortunately uh, and then uh, maybe so that's that's another trouble of research in indonesia ARD. In Indonesia, and I think in many other countries, uh, the challenge is research seems to be too much bureaucratized uh, directions. Even in Indonesia, the, the National Research Agency was the chairman of the council was headed or led by the head of the power, head of the main part, political party. Uh, that's, that's very bad. I mean, uh, so what we need from uh, what we need to educate Indonesian uh, scientific community or even the government itself is that direct uh, research has to be among a scientific association and research has to be global so maybe Eadi can can you know can can give examples of how to do this I mean uh, that's this one and the second one is I always hear about decolonization here in this conference <laughs> but I think my field uh, experience in doing uh, legislations with government 
my critics to those processes is always the same. We always, for some reason, try to attempt to start from scratch. Everything started from scratch. Let's begin with brainstorming and blank papers. But there are many lessons learned from other mistakes that people in the North did in the past that we can learn, you know? I think that's not to be decolonized. I don't know the term, yeah? But that's, that's, that's also, that AI also uh, can, you know, like can have initiative on that. Uh, where there is a where where there is hope, uh, many, <clears throat> given my complaint before about some certain sub authoritarianism, now in Indonesia, actually basically people are free to say anything, and there are compromise within the government. There are some progressive ministers. There are some not. There are some ministers who are doing reform. There are some not. I should acknowledge that, but there are hope that even in the circle of the government or cabinet, well, should be more, but still I think it works and Indonesia, we, ca we, we cannot uh, forget that it's the largest Muslim democracy in the world that seems working a bit slowly. It's not regressing. I cannot say it's regressing. It's progressing, as you can see. So there is hope. That's one of the hope that we have. Um, let me just go in the order of what I think I would like to talk about. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, the, I think uh, coming from the Europe side, Europe has had a long tradition in development studies in association with development cooperation, colonialism, all these things tied together. And uh, you also had very critical sort of assessment and critical thinking about the role that you have played in the world. And I would like to perhaps suggest that you take that in a productive way, think about uh, what uh, development studies and development cooperation or international development cooperation, because of the critical thinking and critical actions that you have taken over time to think about what should be done, what is the right way, what, what should be the right modality of international development partnership. And I think that's the way forward. For a country like South Korea, who was a recipient of foreign aid for a long time, uh, we really um, rose from a country of extreme poverty in 1950s with GNP per capita of $80. We're poorer than uh, many sub-Saharan African countries and, and receive support during the Korean War from these countries. And, and we were able to use that. Uh, but so we have learned our lessons and we would like to, to reflect on some of the, the problems and critical issues uh, from the colonial legacy uh, development cooperation, foreign aid that had all its warts and problems, but also reflect on what could be good from foreign aid. So as we move forward, uh, I think EADI could be a catalyst of, of maybe we need to use different language, maybe we need to come up with different terminology, partnership, to think about what the Global South and Global North can work together in terms of partnership. And in particular, I would like to focus on higher education because without higher education, I do think we're gonna be looking, uh, you know, 10 years from now after another pandemic saying, gee, we, we should have learned from COVID-19 and should have done this, should have done that, and why are we here? Uh, somebody asking another question, shouldn't, shouldn't we have learned and made these changes? Because we knew what the, what the causes were and we didn't do anything about them. So if we can put our heads together, learning from our mistakes going forward. And I think the tie is tying development studies with 
International Development Partnership Development Cooperation. Um, and I would like to suggest in very concrete terms, uh, thinking and presenting uh, norms and guidelines of higher education cooperation is something that EID can work on because currently the OECD guidelines don't really talk about higher education nor UN or other international bodies or NGOs because uh, higher education has been off the table. So maybe yeah, EID could be a good place to start. Uh, as another concrete action, I really think student mobility, students should be exposed to international networking, students should be, um, you know, we're probably hopeless. I can't change my behavior attitude, you know, at my ripe age. <laughs> I'm not going to just tell you how old I am, um, but it's harder for me to change. But my students in their 20s, they're willing and able to change. So I, I hope we can start uh, an exchange of students uh, and they're very able and mobile. So a uh, real exchange of students across continents, across universities as, as a real effort. Uh, hope, uh, when I look at my students, I do see hope regardless of the, 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 the media's, media stereotype about the MZ generation, that they're selfish, they're individualistic, and so on, their behaviors tell me something else. They're individualistic, but they're also altruistic in some strange way that we don't understand. Uh, they're very focused on fairness, justice, uh, so they do give if they see the right cause. They don't give much because they're not very rich yet, but they do give. Give So at, the, at my university, when I see the patterns of, of giving, over 50% of our funding, uh, giving comes from uh, 20s and 30-year-olds. I was really surprised when I looked at the facts, not the amount, but the number of people who are giving to the university, over 50% come from 20s and 30 year olds, which I thought was very uh, surprising, but it was a pleasant surprise. Finally, this is the most global and international generation. Why don't we take advantage of that, harness that energy, or harness that globalness and international, uh, international uh, characteristics uh, through yeah, yeah, the, and, and make them truly global, make them truly less prejudiced than our generation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, just uh, my comments on these views. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, EID is in a very good position strategically because it actually represents the largest body of development studies, I believe, the world over. So, and, and, and this will resonate very much with what the, the colleagues have mentioned, just its, its footprint and its sheer location allows it to be a force that can drive, you know, uh, change far better, faster and more effectively than any other space where we find development studies. So I think we should use the agency and the muscle of EID in making um, collaborations. Uh, well, on the downside of this is the fact that EID at present is an international, well, we have what is called international development, but its content, again, is not reflective of the international geography of, of, of thoughts and, and so on. So perhaps when EAID starts to flex its muscles the world over, it should then begin also by partnership and collaborating. One of the most important things that I think should happen that is quite practical is for us to, and I'd like to also uh, to resound the words that were, were said by, by my colleague Yusuf, that sometimes we don't have to undermine small actions such as brainstorming. It's, it's very important. We may not have right answers right now or concrete plans, but what's particularly important for now is this brainstorming about what would a character of international development that is inclusive look like. We may have several research projects 
bringing people across the world together to imagine this and put it down to say, this is what we conceive to be international development. We may have several volumes. I'm not a person of the isms, I'm more into the idea of movement and motion, which will change. It will, of course, change over time. But if we start the process of what an inclusive international development looks like, the idea can, of course, germinate and it can, we don't have uh, right answers right now, but certainly getting people, different people, I use this word very, <laughs> with, with protest, <laughs> because I'm more for sameness, um, around the table uh, to bringing their thoughts, the experiences, and negotiating those, and I'm sure a consensus will be agreed. Once we'll have something that is meaningful that we can call it international development, that would be applicable everywhere. And that for me is a sense of hope um, that, that, that I have. Um, of course, the, the, yeah, and another sense of hope for me is, 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 is this platform in of itself, you know, um, it's already making that initiative uh, and development studies, I, I really truly want to congratulate it, you know, especially from, from this side of the world, from being amenable and also accepting, you know, critical dialogue and being able to accept its own problems, you know, acknowledging its own problems, because that's a starting point of us to reconstitute or to reconstruct you know, how we imagine a future of development to be like. And, 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 and it is really with great humility, you know, um, that we see, we see this, 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 you know, I, I, I truly appreciate this because we have to, I believe, um, you know, accept the wrongs and be able to identify opportunities where we can reconstruct for positive, yeah, uh, implementation. Thank you. So very short because we are running out of time. Um, regarding uh, your question about the ADI, I think that maybe uh, one way is to reinforce what you are already doing, but reinforce this global collaboration and partnership based uh, in an equitable uh, manner. I think we, we have some examples here, and this is uh, quite important. Um, I also would suggest that you, you develop or reinforce uh, this idea of more community engagement and participation, just to be sure that you include all voices and not only the voice of academia or universities in, in everything. Obviously in this kind of meetings and congress, but also in all uh, day activities. Uh, maybe the example that I gave uh, yesterday, what we are doing in Claxo, this idea in that in every program that we develop in Claxo, that is to say research, training, communication or whatever, we always include uh, academic policymakers and social movements together and articulate them uh, in in every activity. And finally, uh, the question about hope. Uh, very briefly, I think this idea of the political dimension of everyday life, for me, represents really a hope. And um, the, the idea of having common or public, that is a discussion, but uh, maybe common goods and values and obviously from a Latin America perspective, we have a, a social movement that is giving hope to everyone, especially to women, but to everyone that is the feminist movement that is really uh, achieving important transformations in uh, our region. I will say it's the more revol revolutionary movement that we have nowadays in Latin America. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me just uh, try, try and conclude. I, I won't take too long because uh, people are waiting for the lunch and we're slightly over time. Um, it seems to me there are, there, there are reasons for hope, picking up on, on that point. Um, I've got a, a list of things that Iadi can think about next. And 
I will be inviting you to brainstorm with us uh, these things too. So the, there's an attempt to co-create uh, in a global community. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, trying to think more about the mistakes of the global north and what might be learned from those. I think it's really interesting. I'm just picking out pieces here, thinking about uh, uh, global north, global south. Uh, I guess developing together uh, with a, with with yourselves and others norms or guidelines for higher education cooperation is a very nice idea that we could do together. Thinking more about student mobility would be really nice. Um, of course, there are financial constraints, but that maybe there's ways to overcome those. Um, particularly picking up on this the kind of globalness of the next generation and different ways of thinking. Uh, um, and uh, as you pointed out, Sibika, you know, ERD is the biggest association for development studies, and so that gives us a chance to f flex the muscles, as you suggested, and realise that we do have agency by age, some kind of agency by size and footprint. Uh, and we need to build our partnerships globally and equitably to do that. And then uh, just picking up on the the idea of uh, imagining uh, or imagining together with yourselves and others the uh, a truly inclusive uh, development studies, um, bringing together uh, not only scholars but also policymakers, the social networks, uh, and the community engagement and other voices too. So. As an association, we have plenty to think about, uh, and I would like to thank you for coming. Uh, I would, I've been asked to remind you that the panels go on later, uh, just in case anyone uh, thinks this is the end. It's not. There's more panels going on, and we say goodbye at the afternoon coffees. Please join me in saying a very big thank you to our speakers on this closing plenary. Thank you. Thank you.